Public affairs programming on WQPT is brought to you by The Singh Group at Merrill Lynch. Serving the wealth management needs of clients in the region for over 25 years. Rewriting health care and a wall that's opening doors for Vietnam veterans in the cities. This week, Republicans in the U.S. Senate decided to hold off on a vote to repeal Obamacare and replace it with a GOP Senate plan called the Better Care Reconciliation Act, which changes the House version called the American Health Care Act. Republicans say their plan still offers federal tax credits to help people buy health insurance, just not as much. It eliminates extra federal money to states as an incentive to expand Medicaid, and it gets rid of Obamacare tax increases that served as a penalty for those who didn't buy insurance. The Congressional Budget Office predicts the Senate plan will leave 22 million Americans without insurance in 10 years, though. And joining us are two people on the front line of the health care debate. Doug Cropper, who is the chief executive officer of Genesis Health System based in Davenport. Kirk Norris, who is the chief executive officer of the Iowa Hospital Association. Thank you both Thank you, for John. joining Thank us. You. And let me start with you, Doug, because here in the Quad Cities, Genesis, you have seen changes in the impact of Obamacare. Have they been mostly positive, or, or what have you seen as far as the current system has gone? Well, there's no question they were positive. If you look at the Affordable Care Act, it really did two things that were pretty dramatic. One, there were a host of insurance reforms that happened, like allowing your children to stay in your plan until the age of 26, community rating, which helped a lot of people, and then certainly getting 20 plus million people coverage, mostly through Medicaid expansion. That's been dramatic. Of uh, you know, getting more people into places where they could receive health care, uh, prevention, and wellness services. And Kirk, is that a story that we've seen statewide in Iowa? Yeah, <clears throat> we've seen it statewide in two facets. One, people accessing the individual insurance market, which you're hearing talked about a lot now because 70,000 folks in Iowa in the balance relative to whether or not they'll be able to access insurance through those markets in 2018 and then about another 150,000 people in Medicaid uh, accessing insurance. And virtually all the folks that those 150,000 in Medicaid didn't have coverage before. So are we talking mostly rural or urban? I mean, uh, is, is there some, some kind of a change there, whether you live in a rural area and then an urban area on whether or not you were helped more? Well, in, interestingly enough, there's a new study out by the University of North Carolina, uh, their Center for Rural Health Care and Georgetown University. And, Historically, you would think of Medicaid as an urban-oriented program, but their study demonstrates that today, you know, 60-some years after Medicaid started, in a relative sense, it's more important in rural America than it is in urban America as a percent of the population that's served. The big part of Obamacare was to try to at least slow down the spiraling increase as far as health care costs are concerned. Right. Some say that just has not been as effective as it had been hoped. Well, I disagree with that. Uh, there, uh, one thing that's not being talked about are all the payment reforms that went into place. And quite frankly, the hospital community took huge reductions in future payments to help cover the costs of having folks insured. And if you looked at the growth rate of healthcare in terms of the expense of healthcare, it's been at a much lower pace since 2010 than it was prior to 2010. There's a lot of things going on, uh, which Doug can speak about as well, in terms of his system's involvement, uh, innovations in healthcare, where you want to talk about account accountable care organizations, uh, organizations taking uh, care of people uh, with financial risk involved. In other words, they have some skin in the game. You look at all the quality metrics that are out there today, and then just historically, in the state of Iowa, being one of the most efficiently managed healthcare systems in the country. So. So can I, can I add to Please, that? Please, because I mean, it's obvious that you have to be in the game and be competitive. Did this make you more competitive? Well, can I go back and answer the sure. question? If you look at actually a very important statistic, the per capita cost of Medicare enrollees, over 65, actually that has gone down in recent years on an annual basis. So costs have actually gone down for uh, the total individual spending over the course of a year. What's happening within healthcare is as the a population ages, more you know, 10,000 people a day come into Medicare, so the total spend by the government is increasing. But the per capita cost has actually been controlled 
better recently than it ever has uh, probably in the history of healthcare in the last 20 or 30 years. And to follow up, I mean, are hospitals better able to control costs now than they were before? I mean, is that one of the uh, areas where uh, 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 improved healthcare has occurred? Well, no question, particularly in Iowa. Iowa, as a, a collection of healthcare systems, has embraced uh, population health and an accountable care organization model. Uh, if you look at the two health systems in this market, both Genesis Health System and Unity Point Trinity, we're both working in these kind of models. And those models change the way we get paid and give us incentives to hold down the total cost of care uh, on an annual basis. Now, Iowa is unique. Almost all the hospitals and health systems in Iowa have embraced this. That's not true necessarily of other states, and I think that's one reason why Iowa is ranked one of the top uh, uh, states in the union as far as the value of health care. Well, Kirk, whenever we're talking about health care, it seems everyone talks about the insurance industry, the insurance suppliers, and the fact that Iowa is down to one insurance provider. Are you worried that the insurance industry is the one that's really overly running our health care uh, uh, networks? Well, actually, I think there's a partnership right now between insurance and providers. One of the models that we talked about and that has been encouraged by the ACA are accountable care organizations where um, provider organizations take on risks. The insurance industry has trended what there is going on with Medicare with private insurance and so that requires a partnership, a relationship, a contractual agreement um, with providers to do that. There's no doubt that the insurance industry has um, certainly significant input in terms of how our insurance markets evolve. The fact that they're leaving markets right now because the government or Congress hasn't said what they're going to do in 2018 relative to subsidizing folks are, that are the riskiest patients. I mean, we've heard over and over about the one Wellmark patient that's a hemophiliac that costs a million dollars a year. That, that's just illustrative of the fact that we need to get back to some of the principles and in insurance that we've had historically, which is community rating. And one of the things that the insurance industry has said all along is we need everybody in. That's where the individual mandate came from. Mm -hmm. That's where the employer mandate came from. The insurance industry was saying, we want everybody in so we can spread the risk. Well, one of the things that happened in Iowa was uh, there were about 70,000 individuals that were allowed to grandfather in their individual plans with Wellmark. And so you, what you were left with were the 70,000 highest risk, costliest patients. And so you get the dynamic where underwriting that becomes a problem for insurance companies. Wellmark said they lost, I think, in the area of 80 or 90 million dollars right. um, in the, the last year on those insuring those individuals. So what we really need to talk about in the insurance area and what the ACA was doing in terms of moving down that path is there's a need to spread the risk because certainly our most vulnerable citizens need coverage. And Doug, I was going to ask you that exact question. The most vulnerable in the community are, are the ones that have the least ability to pay, of course, and sometimes have some of the largest medical problems. I mean, are, are, do you fear for the most vulnerable oh, at this point forward? There's no question. We're talking about nationwide 20 plus million people in either bill, either the bill that was proposed or passed by the House or proposed by the Senate, 20 million people losing coverage of health care. And the only alternative these people have is to go to our emergency departments, which clogs up the emergency departments for care, which is a very ineffective way to deliver care. So where do we go from here? I mean, you're obviously keeping an eye on both bills. Let's start with you, Kirk. I mean, you're, you're looking at both bills. You got the House version, which even the president was hinting that it's too mean. You got the Senate version that seems to not be enough for the conservatives and not enough for the liberal people in the Congress. So where do we stand right now? Well. If the president believes that the House bill is too mean, the Senate bill is meaner. Uh, and that's our position. We're very concerned about the wholesale change in the relationship of how Medicaid is being financed. That has nothing to do with the ACA, with political philosophies as to how we should go about insuring, providing insurance to folks that need it. It's about rewriting financing rules for Medicaid that have been in place for over 60 years. And the impact of that is significant. That's a lion's share of where the $800 billion reduction for Medicaid comes from. And we just came from the Community Health Center, the Federally Qualified Health Center over in Davenport uh, this morning. And, and I can tell you from visits last week in D.C. with my membership 
and our senator's office, the illustrations that people can pr provide that, that show folks improve productivity, their improved health, when you get them in and you're managing their chronic illness. I mean, there were numbers provided this morning relative to how many more pre-screenings there's been for depression, how many more pre-screenings there's been for diabetes, how many more pre-screenings there's been for colorectal ca cancer. When resources for those things goes away, folks go back to doing what they were doing before, they, they don't have a primary care provider, and they start accessing the emergency room. And a lot of times, not only is that an inefficient place to get care, as Doug uh, indicated, in terms of it's a high cost area, it also does not provide effective management of those chronic diseases. It also sounds like when you hear the mantra of repeal Obamacare and then revise and reform, that you really don't agree with the repeal. No, we don't. We, the hospital community, supported the passage of the ACA because it would provide coverage for folks. The fundamental underpinning for that was get folks into the system so we can take better care of them and lower costs over the long term. That's still our position. There's issues with the ACA relative to um, some of the, the premium increases that are going on that relates to the essential benefits that are there. There's issues related to uh, the unpredictability of whether or not Congress is going to subsidize insurance companies for underwriting people. Those are things that need to be addressed. Um, rewriting financing on Medicaid, cutting access to folks um, on Medicaid is not something we support. When it came to Obamacare and the creation of Obamacare, the debate was really whether or not the federal government should be even involved in the first place. Do you think that train has already left the station? Because now we're just looking at ways to improve it rather than getting out of health care completely. Well, there's no question that the government for us, ex for ex an example, is 70 percent, uh, pays 70 percent of our business if you combine Medicare and Medicaid. So the government's already in the business. It's a matter then of how to use that influence that they have to really change health care for the better, to improve quality and decrease costs. So they're already there. I think it's a matter of, uh, like Kirk was saying, it's a matter of refining what's already been passed, which would be much better than repealing and replacing. So where do you go from here, Kirk? I mean, you're going to be lobbying. I know that. I mean, how, how do you twist arms right now? You've got an Iowa uh, congressional delegation that's mostly Republican. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we certainly work with both parties. As I mentioned, we were out in D.C. a week ago. Uh, our membership, Doug included, uh, we were one of the largest employers in the state. We have over 70,000 employees in Iowa hospitals. And so we're educating people on the implications of this. I've indicated that it's every bit as relevant, if not more so, in rural Iowa as urban Iowa, getting our senators to understand that the good work that they've done over the years, particularly Senator Grassley, on rural hospital issues and greater equity for Medicare could be largely erased by the type of cuts they're talking about in Medicaid. So really uh, continuing to provide that information and continuing to try to influence their decision making on that and, and just you know engaging the democratic process. I said this morning, um, this is about, democracy is always, always about fighting for the resources you think you need for the people that you're serving. And that's what we're doing. We're fighting for those resources. And Doug, what do you say to the people in the Quad City area? I mean, what do they look for? What should they be doing? What should they be concerned about as this process moves forward? I think they should be concerned about a loss of coverage that's massive in the United States and very large within Iowa and even larger in Illinois. We're talking about in, in Iowa, uh, 220,000 people that were expanded in Medicaid, whom almost all of those would lose their coverage based on the bill. So I would hope people would get actively involved in the process, being heard. We have two Republican senators in the state of Iowa, as an example, and uh, those senators need to hear from people about how they feel about what's being proposed and the, and the loss in coverage that would be massive. Doug Cropper, Chief Executive Officer, Genesis Health System, and Kirk Norris, the Chief Executive Officer of the Iowa Hospital Association. Thank you both Thank for you. joining us. Thank you. Well, June seems to have breezed right by us, so Laura Adams has her sights on July, and here's some great community events you might want to consider if you go out and about. This is Out and About for June 26th through July 2nd. Hi, I'm Laura Adams. The Mississippi Valley Blues Festival presents amazing blues at LeClaire Park in Davenport beginning June 30th. Stars and Stripes and Saxophones is performing at the Bettendorf Veterans Memorial Park on June 30th. Or Dance the Night Away at the Stars and Stripes Square Dance at the Geneseo Community Center July 2nd. 
Fort Byron is the site for the third annual Baby Blues and BBQ Fest, July 1st, starting at 5. Or bring a chair and your own refreshments to the campground at Alinawick Forest Preserve in Hampton for music by Kickin' Back. Pioneer Village in Walcott holds a 1920s style ice cream soda fountain on Saturdays and Sundays from 11 to 6 p.m. Enjoy a sundae or a cone. Barcelona-based Alma Afrobeat Ensemble will be playing the historic Skellington Manor on June 27th. The concert will support the Pay It Forward Foundation installing deep water wells in Africa. There are several shows on the circus stage. Branson on the Road on June 29th. The hilarious family musical, A Year with Frog and Toad, along with Snapshots, a musical comedy romance with songs taken from more than a dozen different stage, film, and TV works. Timberlake Playhouse in Mount Carroll presents Eugene O'Neill's Ah! Wilderness, starring Pat and Patty Flaherty of Moline. For more information, visit WQPT.org. Thank you, Laura. The Westbrook Singers may have retired from the stage, but their music lives on. The Quad Cities first family of gospel music recorded some of their favorite songs with us, and we're happy to keep sharing them. Here's the Westbrook Singers with Not One. No, 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 no.
The Westbrook Singers, with not one. It is a moving tribute to the men and women who gave their lives during the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War Memorial was completed in 1982, located near the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. As the memorial marks its 35th year, a replica is on the road with the next stop here in the cities. And joining us is Michael Carton, the director of education for WQPT and one of the coordinators of bringing it here to the Quad City area. Welcome. Thank you, Jim. This is all part of a greater initiative that WQPT has involving the military, is it not? That's correct. We've had our mil embracing our military initiative for um, almost four years now, and so this is sort of the next step in it. And tell me a little bit about this wall. I mean, the, the replica is it's not a small thing. This is not a small underdoing. No, it's not. It's 250 feet long. It's a half-scale replica of the Vietnam Veteran Memorial in D.C., and it looks just like it. It's just half-scale. So. It has been very emotional um, for so many people. Uh, the, the hero flights are now heading to Washington, D.C. to see the real one. Um, and, and, and it really seems to be able to connect and also help some of the veterans. Is that kind of the whole point of bringing it here to the cities? Absolutely. Uh, the reason it's called the Wall That Heals is it gives those veterans a chance to sort of heal from those wounds that they suffered there or the, that their friends suffered there, both mentally and physically. So. Um, bringing it here to the Quad Cities gives them a chance to, I guess, experience it in the comfort of their own home. Yeah, hometown. make it a little bit easier um, and more accessible. It's the last weekend in July. It arrives with your opening ceremony on Thursday, July 27th. Tell me a little bit about that opening ceremony. What's planned? We have Ray Torres, who's a mm -hmm. Vietnam veteran who was awarded the Purple Heart. He'll be speaking. He was actually featured on the History Channel's Vietnam in HD a few years back. And he was discovered because of the Veterans History Project, which is a, a thing that the Library of Congress has been doing for some time. And, and so he's going to be speaking about his experience and how um, it's important for veterans, especially Vietnam veterans, to get the help that they need. Now, not only is it for veterans, I mean, you also want to make it a major educational opportunity for children as well and I know that on Friday is what's called Military Kids Day. I mean you really want other generations to understand exactly what the wall represents. Absolutely and so those military kids, the, the kids of military members here in the Quad Cities are going to get to come to, to the Wall That Heals and experience the Wall That Heals but they're also going to get to do some artwork with someone from the Figgy Art Museum. Um, they're going to be doing perspective drawing which I think is um, appropriate, especially given the topic of Vietnam. I mean, it seems strange to say something like this, but I mean, this is a perfect opportunity to bring a family. I mean, it's it not a picnic. It's actually a major educational opportunity. Absolutely. And there's lots of things for them to do when they come to the wall that heals. Not only experience the wall itself, they'll also get to see the mobile education center. Um, they can see preview screenings of Ken Burns' new documentary that's coming out in September, the Vietnam War. They'll get to see an exhibit that the students at Western Illinois University put together, their museum studies program put together. Um, there's just an awful lot of other things that they can do, and it's a chance for you know different generations to talk to each other about the war and about that Vietnam era. But as you did mention, it's also the Veterans History Project, which is an ongoing project. And it really is an opportunity to try to uh, capture uh, history, what, verbally and visually before it's gone. Exactly. Um, on Saturday, we're going to have the Veterans History Project. From noon to 3, veterans can come and tell their stories. And we picked that day because it's the day of um, the BICs. So we know that there's going to be a lot of folks in town, you know, family members who will be there at the wall and hopefully they'll stop by and they'll tell their story of their time in service. So where on the western campus is this going to be located? I mean, for people who are not real <laughs> familiar, you don't have a lot of room on the campus area. It's actually on campus, but it's on the west side of campus I between see. the mills and where the western library is. There's a big open grassy field there. And there's plenty of room, yeah, of course, and there's plenty of parking as well. Absolutely. But you were also mentioning a few of the other things that beyond the wall are there, um, some interactive exhibits, and I think that's really kind of important as well. Right, the, the wall that heals comes in an 18-wheeler trailer, truck trailer, and the trailer actually doubles as a mobile education center. So there's artifacts in there that people have left at the wall in D.C. Um, that are on that trailer so people can better understand the Vietnam era and, and Vietnam War. And one other thing has to do with uh, volunteerism. I mean, you're always looking for some people to help. What are you looking for? We're really looking for volunteers who, who want to come out and help honor those vet Vietnam veterans. Um, we have slots available for volunteering to set up the wall that heals on Wednesday afternoon, um, overnight shifts, because we're manning it 24 hours a day from, from Wednesday through Sunday. Um, so we need volunteers 
to just be there to help visitors and, and guide them to whatever they need help with. And then once again, we have got it starting on Thursday, the 27th. Closing ceremony will be uh, that Sunday, is that right? That's correct. And what happens at the closing ceremony? Um, we're just going to sort of wrap it up. Uh, Dr. Yeah. Art Tate from Davenport School District is going to be our closing ceremony speaker. He's also a Vietnam veteran, um, did three tours in Vietnam, and so he's going to be speaking at the closing ceremonies. So what's your best pitch? It's going to be here at the end of July. I mean, people could be starting planning right now, either by volunteering or, or making sure that you bring your family. Absolutely. We'd love to have families come out and volunteer, especially like intergenerational. You know, grandpa and, and grandkids can volunteer together and, you know, they can talk about their exper his experience or her experience in the war. Um, or just in, in protesting the war at the same time. We know there's lots of different perspectives on the Vietnam War, but we're, we want people to come out and tell their story and, and volunteer and, and experience the wall. Michael Carton, Director of Education for WQPT, thank you for joining us. Once again, it arrives on Thursday, July 27th. It is accompanied by a mobile education center that will be located on the Western Illinois University Quad Cities campus. The ceremony, July 27th, that's the opening day and we're looking for volunteers once again to help during the three day display and to learn more and to register to volunteer, all you have to do is head to our website at wqpt.org. On the air, on the radio, on the web and on your mobile device, thanks for taking some time to join us as we talk about the issues on the cities. Public Affairs programming on WQPT is brought to you by The Singh Group at Merrill Lynch. Serving the wealth management needs of clients in the region for over 25 years.